This morning, we're going to be in a uh, letter that will be familiar in name, but probably one that you haven't read in a while, and it is 3 John. It is not John chapter 3, it is 3 John. If you open up your Bible all the way back to Revelation, right before Revelation is Jude, and that's like a page, and right before Jude is 3 John, and it's a page. So, if you need help, check your table of contents or look at the screen. So what I want to focus on this morning throughout this passage is that we all kind of have choices that we make. And specifically where it's graduation Sunday, I want to challenge you as, as graduating seniors moving on to future stages of your life, I, I want you to strive for maturity in Christ more than you strive for things in the world. But what I also hope is that through that challenge to them that you as a church body and you as people visiting will also be challenged by the necessity to live and walk in the truth. So again, Third John, as you find your way there, I just want to give you a quick word about um, the, the kind of the context. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. As you could probably assume, Third John was written by John. This is the Apostle John. It's pretty much not disputed who it was. So he refers to himself as the elder in the beginning of the letter, probably to point to his age, but more importantly, to point to the authority that he had by being an eyewitness to Jesus' life. So he calls himself the elder, and unlike most of the other letters written in the New Testament, except for Philemon, this one was written to a personal individual. Most of the other letters that we have are written to churches, but this one in particular was written to his friend named Gaius. I love that name for whatever reason. I just like the name Gaius. It's just like a strong name. That has nothing to do with the sermon. Just like it. And it's about Gaius's exemplary Christian character and John encouraging him to continue that on. There will be other references to other individuals and other things going on at the life and time of the church um, where these guys were, but we're going to get there in a moment. So we're going to break this up into a couple of different sections. And the first, we're going to read one through four. Our first section, we're going to focus on walking in the truth, walking in the truth. So John, the elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way and are in good health, just as your whole life is going well. For I was very glad when fellow believers came and testified to your fidelity to the truth, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in truth. Hopefully that last verse resonates with you as one you've heard. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we find John referring to himself as an elder to carry authority in the way that he wrote because it was very easy at the time to try to second-guess letters that were coming in to various people to testify about things that were real about Christ or false about Christ. And so it was always nice to be like, I walked with Jesus, okay? <laughs> walked with Jesus. I don't know what you've done in your life. I got to witness Jesus' three years of ministry alongside him, and what I have to say is true about him. And so the weight that John carries to his friend Gaius is one that we also respect and enjoy even though it has now been made broad. It's like sending a personal text message to somebody, but now it's public, and I'm grateful that it is public because there is a lot here that we can read. So he reminds Gaius, interestingly enough in verse 2, that he prays for him to be prosperous and to have good health. What's really interesting about this in particular is that in a lot of these letters, it was common to ask how people were doing physically. It's not like you could just text them or walk down the street. There were often long intervals of time between even having a conversation with somebody. So it was always nice to know how they were doing. Rather than ask him how his physical well-being is, he points to how strong his spiritual well-being is and prays that his physical well-being will follow in the exemplary spiritual vigor that he has. His entire life is going well, and he walks in the truth. And that is quite the testament to an individual in Scripture. I don't know how many of us could insert our name there 
and the exact same would be said of us. That's quite challenging in my own life. So again, he kind of forsakes the typical custom, but he points to an even greater reality of this man's life. For more than wealth and more than health, he was a spiritual man of God who John loved dearly. And people around Gaius testified to the fact that he was everything he claimed to be. He was as genuine as they came. On the basis of all people's testimony that met Gaius, it would be reported back to John, you know what, there's a couple of good dudes out there. Gaius, he's great. What a tremendous person. So what does this mean? What, why are we so focused on this? Well, I want you to look again at the bottom of verse 3. Testify to your fidelity to the truth, how you are walking in truth. Most of us know that walking requires action and movement. I've never really walked standing still, and don't hit me with the treadmill joke. You're still kind of moving forward, right? Never walk standing still, unless you're Michael Jackson, I guess. I don't know. He does some moonwalk, I suppose. But walking means movement. It means active. There's a purpose behind walking. If I want to get somewhere, I walk. Or if you want to run, you can run. But the goal of walking in truth is to not be passive and inactive. A lot of us like spiritually sitting in the truth. We're really good at being spiritual couch potatoes in the truth. Not so good at walking in the truth. And I think too many times we see Christianity as this thing that we kind of get to check off and take a step back from and, and sit on. Where we just kind of hold it near and dear and there's no purpose, there's no action, there's no movement behind anything that we do. It's just a passive la-di-da. Christ is good. So when walking in the Greek is used throughout the entirety of the New Testament, it is very frequently synonymous with the word living. You could just translate it living in truth, how you are living in truth. Every facet of Gaius' life was permeated by Jesus Christ. In Galatians 5.25, we see that if we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Jason just preached about this a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't say, if we sit by the Spirit, let us also keep sitting by the Spirit. You guys get the point that I'm trying to make. Ephesians 5, 15, pay careful attention then to how you walk or how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. There is great emphasis in the New Testament about walking in truth. Many of us may be past this point of sitting, and we're on the thing with walking, but we may not be walking in the right direction. We have to be walking in truth. So he actively, Gaius, lived his life actively for Christ and for the sake of people that were near him and for the sake of the church that he was in. And when others would come back to John, it was very clear what this man stood for and who he was. He was not a duplicitous individual where one friend would say, well, he's this way at work, but, you know, when you see him in the church, he's a completely different way. Or when I see him on the ball field, it's like he's a different person. Gaius was Gaius through and through, and that was on the basis of everybody that came into contact with him and reported back to John. So third John, in this letter, he shows us that genuine faith should be encouraged. Whoa should be encouraged. It's nice to hear you're doing a good job. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. Everybody wants to be told they're doing well. And just because you're doing really well at something doesn't mean that you want people to be silent about it. What we need to understand is that we are weak and we are frail. Just because Gaius was an upstanding individual, it didn't mean that he didn't have disappointment didn't mean that there wasn't resistance, as we're about to find out later in the letter. Even though he was doing great, John said, keep it up, man. Everything about you is testifying to how much you love Christ. And I'm afraid in Christianity as a whole, 
What we do is we see people that are doing a really good job and we would rather seek to tear them down or to criticize the ways in which they're failing rather than to uplift the things that they're doing right. And we need to be challenged by that. We need to challenge ourselves how we, how we deal with young people, seniors going off to college, people who are teenagers, people who are younger, kids. We, we expect the world to be mature Christians and we also expect children to be mature Christians. We hold them to standards that we barely hold ourselves to. And it's easy to point at those who are younger and say, you know, they're doing a pretty bad job of this. Instead, we need to encourage the things they do well. I don't know too many people that really love negative feedback constantly. If you are, all right, that's fine. I'll throw you insults your way if you want to come tell me about it, that's fine. I won't. So what we see instead is in the end of verse 4, the end of this section, what we find to be true about John, not just Gaius, is that John has no greater joy than to hear that his children, his spiritual children, are walking in truth. The great joy of spiritual parenthood is knowing that your kids follow in your footsteps that they live in a way that represents Christ no matter where they are, no matter the circumstances, and what a joy it is for children by blood. There's no greater joy than a parent seeing your child come to fruition and grow in many ways. But spiritually within the church, we should have the same joy for all those who are striving to pursue Jesus Christ. We must up uplift one another. We must understand that we are all weak and struggle. And we also need to understand that we should make every endeavor to, do, to disciple people. Christ's command when he left the earth was disciple the nations. It's impossible to take joy in your spiritual children walking in the truth if discipleship is not the aim. That has to come first. There has to be something you poured into them to actually see come to fruition. And so we have to strive to this end. And it's just the pastoral heart resonating in John, but it should be the heart of all Christians. Where we continually encourage, we uplift, we care, we diligently walk in the faith to show other people how to walk in the faith. When I helped Lucas walk for the first time. You know, you hold his hand as he goes along. Sometimes you kind of leave them to their own devices and let them wobble around and figure it out. But you lead them. You guide them. We do it with every physical aspect of a child's life. And when it comes in the church, how much hand-holding are we doing to younger generations rather than finger-pointing? So we see two great examples of how we should encourage, how we should love, and the things that we should take joy in. And if this is not the thing that brings us joy, then I think we really need to reevaluate where our priorities are. Students that are, are going to college, the, the ones that we're honoring this morning, I would love nothing more, I really would, for you to come back and, and tell me about your you know, your new college program, the new job you're going into, how well you're doing in certain areas, like how much fun you're having with your friends. and Those things are truly great. I would much rather hear about how you're faithfully living for Jesus in spite of all of that. And if we as a church are more encouraging about everything but that, we're doing them a disservice. So the, those kinds of pursuits, these, these aims are the foundation for walking in truth. And now we see the result of that walking in truth. So we've, we've laid the groundwork and now John goes on to say more. Dear friend, you are acting faithfully in whatever you do for the brothers and sisters, especially when they are strangers. They have testified to your love before the church you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, since they set out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from pagans. Therefore, we ought to support such people so that we can be co-workers with the truth. 
So just very briefly, at this time, there would, again, because it's not like everybody had Mustangs they could drive around, right? There would be itinerant missionaries or people that were set out to go plant churches or to go spread the gospel to other nations. And naturally, when they came through certain areas, it would be nice if their brothers and sisters in Christ would give them lodging or food, supplies. Journeys were much more difficult, and they were very long and tedious. So Gaius was a person who was known for his hospitality to brothers and sisters. But I want you to note, especially when they are strangers, Gaius didn't just let his friends and family in the house when they came by, people that he was used to seeing, people that were on frequent trips back and forth or, or whatever it may be. He would accept all those who were set out for the sake of the name even though he didn't know them. Now, John probably was involved in some of the sending of these people, so it is likely that Gaius crossed paths with some of these guys. But we see a testimony to the love of somebody who is willing to accept those he has never met into his home, to give his means to other people, because he considered the sake of the gospel more important than his own comfort. It is easy for us to be hospitable with friends and family. It is much more difficult to do so with people that we have never met because I have a wariness about me, about your intentions and who you are. I'd rather stay in my circle where I'm more comfortable. I don't want to give you my resources. Why would you ask that of me? I don't even know you. But when God is the forefront of our cause and purpose in life, that becomes second nature. And again, throughout churches, throughout, throughout every avenue of life, it's very easy to just cling to the people that you're most comfortable around and forget about those on the outside. And I challenge myself and I challenge you to be much more accepting especially when there are brothers and sisters out there who are endeavoring for the same thing we are. Do you know how territorial churches are? Have you ever thought about it? You know how much transfer growth happens in churches rather than just actual growth? We got a bunch of new members this week. Yeah, well, they left the church down the street. They're mine now. Leave them alone. It's funny, kind of. It's really just kind of tragic. And so when we see Scripture and we see these kinds of challenges and we, we think about our brothers and sisters around the world and around the country and in our own area where there's a million churches around us and we want to be the, the biggest and the best by comparison, we need to not forget that there's a unity in the mission of the gospel. When we would rather tear down people for the things we think they do wrong rather than encourage them to share Jesus Christ, our perspective is off. And when we challenge our students to consider every avenue of their future except for missional involvement with Christ, we also need to change our perspective. Guys, I'm not asking you to go to seminary next week. That's not my goal. It's, I'm not asking you to pursue theological education, though I will support you in doing so. There are many ways which you can serve Christ. Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity will be presented to you to do so. The way in which you respond with your hospitality of people the way in which you would rather work together with people and love people and serve Christ will be a testament to what makes you different from everybody else in the world. I can find division everywhere I go. I don't need to see it among Christ's members. I hope what you find today is that all of those things in life, like a, a great career, your friends, who you marry, that all of those things truly are secondary to a life committed to Christ. Not unimportant, just secondary. So, more to the heart of, of what I mean, um, 
I was thinking about this the other day, and it's kind of a poignant thought and maybe kind of depressing in some ways, but at least that's how I think about it. But there's only so much time that we have with different individuals, right? Like some people are in our lives for a lifetime. Other people are in our lives for a couple of years, and other people maybe a handful of months or, or weeks. And I was thinking about my trip to Disney World and like how many thousands and thousands and thousands of people that I brush shoulders with that I will never ever see again throughout the duration of my life. It's an interesting thought that there's so many of us living our own lives and our own bubbles and our own kind of sphere. And some people are just in for a moment and others for much longer. But it's how we deal with people in those moments that testifies to what's truly within us. If you're hospitable to those who are in your life for but a moment, imagine what the impact will be in their life. If Gaius, this man, had set on some missionaries on their way and months later they're like, you know what, that guy back at that town, that was incredible, right? What an, what an impact that could make in people's lives. So how intentional are we in those moments that are fleeting, being unhospitable, ungracious, unloving toward people that you come into contact with is a reflection of the selfish pride that just pervades the rest of humanity. As Christians, we're called to a much higher standard of service. And since Christ died with his arms wide open, I think it's only fitting that our arms are wide open for all of those that we come into contact with. Gaius had done so that he gained a reputation for it. We also find that this takes a collaborative effort. We ought to support such people so that we can be co-workers with the truth. Christianity is not a contest. We ought to love people because Christ loves people. It's challenging. There are many people you don't like. It's okay to admit That doesn't give us an excuse to not be ungra or to be ungracious toward them. So I want to focus on this next person and not waste too much of your time here. We have a choice before us, okay? We're presented with a choice. The rest of Third John says, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have first place among them, does not receive our authority. This is why if I come, I will remind him of the works he is doing, slandering us with malicious words. And he is not satisfied with that. He not only refuses to welcome fellow believers, but he even stops those who want to do so and expels them from the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. Everyone speaks well of Demetrius, even the truth itself. And we also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have many things to write to you, but I don't want to write to you with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends send you greetings. Greet the friends by name. So here we find a man quite different from Gaius by the name of Diotrephes. Diotrephes is not only domineering in his own church, but he refused to be accommodating to all those who would pass by and refused them entrance into the body of worship. Even more than that, he condemned members of the church for being hospitable toward those people. What an incredible act of vanity, right? Matthew 23 says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You know, being the smartest person in the room does not mean you are wise. Being the most likable person in the room does not make you loving. And just because you might be influential and have people following you does not mean that you are walking the right direction. There has to come a time in our life where we are reflecting on what it is that we are doing and who we are doing it for. What we find is that Gaius and Diotrephes were likely both a part of this same church. And that the reason for this letter was because he says, I wrote a letter, to, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have first place among them, does not receive our authority. I wrote to you guys, but this guy's holding mail back from you. 
When I show up in person, I'm going to have to call him out for what it is that he's doing. There's some interesting dynamics going on in this church. So what's the difference between Gaius and Diotrephes? How do we get in these two places as people? I feel like we know people that are like this, that we at least have models in our life that might exemplify some of the characteristics of either. But if both have started in the way, how have they split in so differing directions? And my proposal is that the primary difference between Gaius and Diotrephes was where their contentment was found. You see, Gaius pursued his walk with Christ, and Diotrephes pursued power as the result of affiliation with Christ. The latter loved to have preeminence in the church. He likely wanted power. He wanted to be the head honcho. He wanted to be the person that would make the decisions that people would follow behind, that they would just do what he told them to do because he knew it all. He wanted to be first and people that want to be first isolate other people that could come in and disrupt it, which is why he would cast everybody else out and fuss at those who would try to be accommodating. Likely Gaius, which is probably the reason for the letter in this recent struggle. There is much about Diotrephes' character that we can speculate, but unfortunately this individual is really common in churches today across the world, people that desire a position rather than to desire service. They desire influence rather than being influential for the kingdom. There's a lot of ways where Christianity can be self-serving if we want it to be. And I think there's a danger here in trying to write Diotrephes off as if he was an unbeliever because there's nothing about the text that would explain that or state that directly. And what happens is when we mischaracterize people or write them off that way, what it's really easy to do is we remove ourselves from the situation, use that person as a scapegoat and say, well, yeah, I'm doing a lot better than Diotrephes has been doing. But ultimately, the difference was between contentment. You see, Diotrephes, as John says, he is not satisfied with that. Not only will he stop mail, not only will he be the ultimate authority in the room, he's not content with that and must send people away. And not only does he individually send people away, he fusses at you to not accept people who are preaching Christ. He became self-absorbed. He became a fool. He had a deeply inflated sense of self-worth. Gaius' contentment was in Christ and in the joy that he had and the people that were walking in Christ. So it becomes only natural in our modern application today is to just simply ask ourselves, are we more like Gaius or are we more like Diotrephes? But really the ultimate heart of the matter is where your contentment lies. Because if your contentment lies in the pursuit of this world, in the pursuit of position, in the pursuit of money, in the pursuit of power, in the pursuit of relationships that will gain you certain things, you will never be content. You will always crave more. There will be a perpetual carrot on a stick, and you will never get it. But if your contentment is found in Christ, He is the true essence of joy. These false, fleeting senses of happiness and contentment disappear because Christ becomes our all in all. Joy and peace are only found in the Lord of Lords. He is the Savior and Redeemer of the world. Nothing you chase after in this life will ever amount to anything He can offer you. And my challenge to you as students, though it may be hard to swallow, is that your goals and your vision for your life are important. They're not unimportant to God, but they are not your God. It's not about how much money you can make, how many degrees you can get, how popular you are around the people in your 
circle. What matters is what you do for Christ and what you do for Christ alone because eternity will come. The last couple of points and we will close. Happiness is driven by circumstances, but contentment is driven by Christ. I want you to hear that one more time, especially for the students in the room. Happiness is driven by circumstances but contentment is driven by Christ. When you chase happiness, a certain alignment of circumstances always has to be perfect. And when one tiny hiccup goes wrong, it's just ruined. I can't tell you the number of days I wake up and have a vision of how the day is going to go, only to have it blown to smithereens. You know what kind of mood that puts me in? Not a great one. And I'm sure it does that to you too. Things happen. Tragic things happen. Things we can't foresee. People we don't get along with. Circumstances that will crush your soul. And then there will be circumstances where things are just awesome. You got that promotion at work and all your friends get along. You have no problems in your marriage. Even you and your in-laws are best friends. Right? Like everything is great. But those are constant ebbs and flows. And they can change in a heartbeat. And if our contentment is rooted in the pursuit of self, like Diotrephes, we'll never truly be at peace. So my challenge to you as a church is that would these students in the room, not just the graduates, but the students, the young people, would these students in the room, would all of them testify about you and say that you walk in the truth? Could they say that about you? If they can't, what is it you need to repent of if you believe the answer is no? And students... Unless you walk in the way of Christ, you will find yourself on a similar path as this man, Diotrephes. You must guard closely against a facade of Christianity versus truly living it. Because it's easy to put on the facade and the covering and the lingo. But you don't become like Christ by being okay with the idea of Christ. You become like Christ by walking with Him. And in your life, as you are about to find out, it gets increasingly less black and white. There's going to be a lot of gray. There's going to be a lot of decisions that you don't know is right or wrong, left, up, down, who knows. It's very difficult. It's not just easy, yes and no. And you are going to need godly wisdom to be able to discern those kinds of decisions because decision, bad decision after bad decision after bad decision will lead you on a path of self-righteousness, self-worth. And sin has so tainted our world that there's going to be distractions, there's going to be opposition, and there's going to be heartache in all of the things that are good and bad in between. And if you are not rooted in Christ, you will, be, you will be tossed to and fro like a leaf in the wind. And through it all, I implore you to walk in truth. Guys, Christ is not an accolade that we can pin on our wall. He's not a token that we get to just kind of hang on to on our keychain. He is God. He is Lord. He has set you free from all sin. He has set you free to be free and live freely in Him and to help others grow in the same. How could you find a better joy or peace than that? You cannot. Shift your focus to Him today. Please. Please.